all uh, is now uh, we are ready for uh, the panel discussion session and uh, this is a special uh, session uh, not uh, as a kind of paper presentation it is kind of a discussion so our key resource persons for the panel discussions are a uh, uh, is Honorable uh, Engineer K. Lal Somvela, advisor to Chief Minister Mizoram, uh, is the connectivity trade aspect of the Kladan project. This is just as a topic. Uh, we can connect uh, this or that also. There is no like uh, as a limit. We want the thought and discussion. Uh, is the second is uh, uh, Mr. Anil Jangil. Uh, is he is a manager of RDS uh, is company involved in construction of the Kladan project uh, highway, Long Thlai, uh, transportation and road aspect of the Kladan project. Uh, the third is, uh, is Mr. Joseph Chinza, uh, he is with uh, us, uh, he is general secretary, uh, is Young Lai Association, Long Thlai with us and uh, the fourth Joe uh, is Mr. Adams Sampring Sangha and it's not coming. So it's unfortunately uh, it's not coming, it's not with us today uh, it's because of uh, uh, some health issue of his uncle uh, uh, last evening so in his or in hospital with uncle. So we have three panel discussion and the panelist, uh, the first is the Honorable uh, Scale Lalsom uh, Vela, sir, uh, advisor to the Chief Minister. And the session chair of this uh, panel discussion, uh, Professor J. Dongel, uh, is Political Science, Mizoram University. He is a kind of a, a academician, deep and wide kind of view, and he is known for his. Uh, uh, comment in media and uh, writings and a uh, kind of a uh, discussion and he is also uh, is like uh, in various like position in the uh, government of Mizoram also. So he will chair the session. I welcome all please come inside uh, is, and uh, sit as uh, the round table. Please uh, fill the chairs. So please come. Now I hand over the mic to uh, Honorable Chair of the Session, <coughs> Professor J. Dongel. Okay. We'll start the program. <coughs> uh, as I have to attend Vice Chancellor meeting with heads and professors of School of Social Sciences. Uh, I It took time, and just after I share my opinion, I asked for their permission and leave the meeting hall. And today, we are glad that we have three important persons, stakeholders, who have the ground experience. So it will be sharing experience and the groundwork today. And We'll go straight to the program. I will invite the speaker one after another in order of the appearance of name in the program. So first will be Engineer K. Lalsam Vela to be followed by Anil Zangit, then Mr. Joseph El Chinza. That should be the order of the speaker. And Pu K. Lalsam Vela, he retired as Chief Engineer, PWD, Government of Mizoram. Yeah. And, with, and with, as, uh, with regard to this uh, Colodyne project or road project and all, he was one of the idea behind the creation and implementation of this project. We may we expect to heard many new things from his experiences. Now may I invite him.
to take his time. Chairman Kuzey uh, Dongal and uh, highly educated people who gather here today. Uh, I am extremely grateful to the organizers of this seminar for inviting me to be one of the panelists. Uh, although my role is to participate in a panel discussion, I rather prefer to have uh, a PowerPoint presentation. And then uh, since a lot has been discussed and presented on the same issue, I think whatever I'll do today will be a sort of repetition, it seems. Uh, I will quickly run through the 27 slides. Uh, I'll try to keep uh, the given time of 15 minutes. <clears throat> uh, starting with introduction, the Galadan Multimodal Project initiated by Ministry of External Affairs was launched under the Lucas policy way back in 1991 to establish close relationship between India and Myanmar. Uh, the initial DPR of the road project between Long Time Mizoram and Kalewa, Kalewa in Myanmar was prepared by Rights Limited in 2003. And the DPR was submitted to Government of India, Ministry of Road Transport and Highways in 2005. After a series of talks and negotiations between officials of Burma and India, the agreement for Kaladar project was signed between the two countries in 2008 with an aim to ease India's access to Southeast Asia and to provide an alternative route between a landlocked Northeast and the rest of India through Haldia, port of Calcutta. As the name multimodal suggests, the project comprises of three modes of transport like land route starting from Long Tlai town in Mizoram up to Paletu, Paletu and Arakan of state of Myanmar. Two is the river route between Paletua and Situe. Formerly Situe was called uh, Situe was called a kip. And the third one is sea route between Situe port of Myanmar and Haldia port of Calcutta. When we talk about a kip, I have a fond memory of the name of this city because it was from this uh, Ekiap city that the legendary leader, Mr. Laldeng and his family, accompanied by Puzoram Thang and Puton Luya, the present chief minister and deputy chief minister, were airlifted by the Pakistani Consulate General to Rangoon and then to Karachi. That's why I fondly remember the city of Ekiap. Now it has been called C2. Uh, the whole project is divided into two parts. One part within India has been funded by Ministry of Road Transport and Highways under SARDP notice. And that work has been entrusted to Mizoram State PWD after signing of agreement between the two countries in 2008. The other portion within Myanmar remains with Ministry of External Affairs. And the work execution has been entrusted to Indian construction agencies. The portion within Myanmar, or Mizoram, that is Long Tlai down to Zorin Pui, has since been declared as National Highway 502A. Why 502A? Why, why A? The, the highway from zero point to Siaha has been declared as National Highway 502. So the nearby highway, when it's declared as National Highway, it has been called 502A. The whole land route is double lane national highway standard. When we say double lane highway, the formation width at cutting the width is always 12 meters. Earlier it was 10 meters, and some, some, since some time ago it has been the extended to 12 meters. And the black topping, what is technically called carriageway width, is 7 meters. Nowadays, the national highway constructed by JICA they are always with PEF soldiers, but unfortunately, this highway is not a PEF solder. When you say the PEF solder, beyond the normal black topping portion towards side drain or the, the hillside, uh, it has always been art solder. Now, this art solder is PEF with bitumen. That's why it is called PEF solder. But this highway is not PEF solder. 
Uh, this particular picture has been shown a number of times, and uh, I think I, I don't need to re uh, repeat it. The, like the three modes of uh, transport, sea route from Cal Calcutta to Shitwe, Shitwe to Paletua is river route, then Paletua to Mizoram is the land route. Uh, these are the two ports, Shitwe port in Myanmar on the left side, and Haldia port is on the right hand side. Now, uh, coming to the project, the project at a glance and status, that is also divided into two parts. One is Mizoram portion. Let us talk about Mizoram portion first. Uh, as I said, the initial DPR was prepared by rights. After agreement was signed between the two countries, the DPR uh, was modified by the State PWD in 2009, and after it was completed, it was submitted to Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, and the Ministry sanctioned the project in 2010, August. After calling off open tender, the physical work was started in October 2010, with initial deadline of 2014. Initially, four years' time was given for completion, but because of uh, many problems, it is not yet completed till today. Uh, the project within Mizoram, Long Tlai 2, Zorin Pui portion, has been divided into three contract packages. The first and the third one was awarded to one contractor, the one in the middle was awarded to another contractor. Uh, the initial surveyed length of uh, almost 100, I wrote 100 kilometer, but it was less, slightly less than 100 kilometer, has been reduced to 87 plus. Now I think it's 87.51 kilometers after actual completion. And because of realignments and diversions at selected locations. Uh, the project course has been revised and then the reason of revision we'll talk about in the latest slide. Now, the latest revised course is 1,131.48 crores. Uh, the overall physical progress as on today is 98.2%. Uh, the work that has been done are formation cutting, culvert retaining wall, side drains, and pavement. Pavement is what we normally call black topping. Black topping is the topmost layer Below the topmost layer, there are two T layers, and the whole, the whole structure is called pavement. Pavement, there are two types of pavement. One is rigid pavement, that's cement concrete pavement, and when you call flexible pavement, it is bituminous pavement. And then uh, that has been substantially completed. There are some small balance works approximately to the two bridges, and then the Long Tlai Diltlang Junction, because the NAS and this ideal project is passing through a project, and there is a junction where black topping work cannot be done until and unless an ideal complete their work. So the overall financial progress is 95.91. There are eight bridges, out of which uh, six have already been completed, and the, the two uh, bridges, the first bridge and the last bridge, are still in progress, and the physical progress as one today is 45%. Uh, the last bridge is in the river uh, bordering Myanmar and Mizoram. The two bridges, the abutments are completed, the superstructure works are ongoing, and fabrication of steel superstructure are in progress. When we say abutment, the bridge, the span, at the two ends, there is a, a sort of wall, retaining wall type, then that is called abutment. These abutments are completed in both cases. Uh, the contract extension has been granted up to December 22. Uh, then the, it is not likely to be completed by the time, and then the department may have to give further extension of time, and most likely, uh, unless there is further problem, the contractor is likely to complete by February 2023. Uh, but there is still uncertainty. There has been a lot of problem created by the local people, the landowners are claiming compensation, which is not yet sanctioned by the Ministry of Road Transport and Highway. Due to non-receipt of compensation, the landowners have apprehension that once the project is completed, they may not get compensation. So they keep on stopping the work. The contractor is now facing another problem. Uh, now that I see some of the few uh, completed sections of the road, this is one section where there is a RCC box calvat with the retaining wall on the downhill side, 
there is a very high hill cut rocky portion and then this a very nice carp very good radius of carp uh, where there is also calvat uh, with the box calvat the high the cut hill cut is also very high the third one this is the the photograph taken during progress of black, bituminous uh, black topping works and with a nice side drain on the uphill side uh, this also one section of the completed portion as we can see the hill cut is very very high of course in this location there is no landslide fortunately there is no much problem uh, oh, sorry uh, out of the six bridges completed this is one of them 45 meter span bridge and this one is 85 meter br span bridge and this is the picture of the bridge taken from top uh, now why there has been long delay what are the hindrances why revision estimate is required we cannot explain all of them but some of the major points will be discussed now uh, initial faulty DPR apparently prepared from Google map initially when the DPR was prepared by rights they could not go inside the forest very thick forest and there was no road so perhaps initial DPR was prepared from Google map next is inaccessibility of bridge sites with machineries to design the bridge before we design the bridge we need subsoil investigation we have to drill the soil deep inside so that after knowing the soil condition, we can design the superstructure, the abutment, what kind of foundation will be there, what kind of structure, superstructure will be there. So to do this, due to non-accessibility of the bridge site, all the bridge sites, uh, real correct estimate of the bridges cannot be made. And then the bridge design investigation, subsoil investigation could be done only when chokeable access road that can carry machineries can reach the bridge sites. Uh, next is very unstable hill with very high cutting, resulting in heavy multiple landslides at numerous locations. Almost every year during a very monsoon during 2011 when the work was actually started until 2020, which in turn used uh, cause road formation collapse requiring heavy retaining wall structure not initially foreseen. That caused a lot. Apart from extra additional heavy retaining structures, Removal of arch spoil itself is very, very expensive. Because of environment issues, the arch spoil landslide landslips cannot be just pushed down hillside. So the contractor has to transport to designated dumping places that has been very expensive. Uh, then next is scarcity of acceptable quality of stone materials for pavement construction. For black topping work for the pavement structures, we need specified quality of materials the bottom one need not be very good quality, but as it goes up to the top layer, the quality, the strength of stone has to be better and better. The good and acceptable quality type of material, stone material is very, very difficult to find. And when we try to get material from nearby river, during monsoon we cannot do. When what the receipts, then we can extract. So a lot of problem we have been facing in collection of materials. Next is remoteness of the project site, coupled with problems of labor. Labor, the labor came, they have to go back, and then spare parts of machineries. Only mach the big machineries are utilized, then there has been a breakdown of machine, spare part is required, there is no spare part in Nizal, they have to import from Calcutta, Delhi, Gujarat, or somewhere. So there is a lot of problem. All construction mat materials are imported <coughs> through National High 54 from Silchar, and then those materials come from different parts of the country. Uh, then, sense of design. Initially, the bridges are designed as pre-stress RCC bridge. But when actual construction started, as I said, we could not find good materials. Because in a pre-stress concrete, the quality of concrete is so high that even in our normal RCC building, when we accept M20 or M15, for the bridge, the thing has to be M40. Some, sometimes M45. For that, very good quality stone is required. But because of material problem, instead of trying to get those difficult materials, it has been decided to change the type of bridge from RCC to steel structure. When you design the steel structure, 
uh, we engage a con uh, designer, but the Ministry of Road, Transport, and Highway requires that the design must be approved by ITT Guwahati. So sending the design to IIT Guwahati, they are professors, they are quite busy, they could not do it very quickly. That itself takes a long, long time. After design is approved, design is done, approval obtained from ministry, and then thereafter only we could start fabrication, steel fabrication. That steel fabrication the contractor is normally doing from Delhi. That itself is a long delaying factor. Uh, because of many factors, the uh, estimate has been revised, and then because of delayed sanction of revised estimate, the contractor suffers, and then the contractor's cash flow dry up, and there has been a fund crunch with the contractor, and without getting revised sanction, he cannot get payment, and he cannot proceed further. That's one problem. Land acquisition issues, that I think it has been discussed a lot earlier. We have been facing a lot of problems. The landowners, as I said earlier, there has been a lot of fake claimants. That's the big problem. Uh, this issue alone, uh, it's a long story. I cannot, I cannot talk about it uh, within a short time. Uh, because of delay or roadblock created by the landowners, the contractor lost a good working time. These roadblocks and bans have also always been called during the best working season. So different occasions, different years, the delay roadblock and the loss of time comes to, the number of days comes to almost six, 600 days. We have lost two, uh, almost two years because of the problem created by the landowners. And of late pandemic, since 2020, uh, serious problem until the early part of this year. We talk about landslide uh, that caused a real problem. This is one photograph of uh, landslide coming down, covering the whole road with slush. They can, cannot move in this type of uh, slush. Uh, yeah, very high, kit, high hill cut, lot of slush come down. The complete, the whole road is fully covered. Water is flowing on the road side. And this also uh, another photograph of landslide. Now let let us see the one of the video of typical landslide. <laughs> okay. Uh, the cut slope, the hill slope, was uh, about forty-five. 45 degree slope, very good slope. And then there were two benching created. Please try to be brief. Slope, along the slope. Somewhere. Mm. Please try to, okay. try to be brief. Okay. And then the, now next is the Myanmar portion. Myanmar portion. And C2 port completed, dredging between the C2 to Paletua and construction of the Z Paletua completed. Land route highway uh, contract awarded 2015. And then the uh, work started in 2007, but because of uh, bankruptcy of the contractor, the work, the contractor abandoned the work in 2019, and then subcontract work was given in 2000, uh, March 2020, but because of insurgency problems, after doing some works, the work has, the contract has been terminated already. Then after termination, first then there was call. The contract awarded again to Ircon International in March 2020 on EPC mode contract. 
and the project total project cost new project cost is 1780 crores with initial deadline of july 2025 uh, the con the MD of the contractor, Irkon, says that instead of taking Indian big contractors who are reluctant to come, uh, they have provided small, small contract packages to local Myanmarese uh, contractors. But because of uh, permission not given by the government of Myanmar and because of our fighting along the project corridor, uh, the work is suspended now. There is uncertainty. We, we never know when the project will be completed. This comparison of the two routes, on the left side is the land route from Calcutta to uh, Asham, then uh, to Aizol. The distance of the land route is 1,589 kilometers, whereas the sea route, the length is 1,069. There is a difference of 520 kilometers. Uh, we may know that the distance between Aizol and Guwahati is 520. So the distance by, by uh, sea route is uh, shorter by 520 kilometers. Uh, these are the trade aspect, economic aspect, potential, who should benefit. Uh, then the Northeastern region, Indian Myanmar may be the beneficiaries. Myanmar is already missed by China, Myanmar economic corridor. And then Northeastern region also benefit to a certain extent, but Mizoram alone may be eventually reap the biggest benefit. Uh, this is the kind of ocean cargo transport. And then uh, there are <coughs> challenges in container, uh, container issues. Cargo carried by ships across the seas only by using container. And these are the type of container, 20 foot and 40 foot. And then handling container cargo uh, at ports and destination itself will be a major, a major challenge for us. Uh, here are container challenges only. These are containers that are used for transportation uh, in pieces. It can be transported by ship. Uh, then there will be employment opportunities. Please Kaldan, try to conclude. Okay. Kaldan project, once operational and if responsibility of port management is with India, there will be substantial uh, opportunity of employment like shipping and port management, like uh, warehousing, custom, agents, etc and then tourism opportunity will be there. Then finally, apart from trade and economic purpose, the route will have strategic importance for our country. Thank you so much. Thank you. Engineer Yelal Vela, Engineer in Chief Retail from PWD, Government of Mizoram, and present advisor technical to the Chief Minister of Mizoram. So he share his experience and how the project has been undertaken practically. And if you have any query or questions, you can note it down. That can be asked in the interaction time. Now may I invite Wu Anil Zangit, General Manager, RDS Longklai, to deliver talk on transportation and road aspect of the Kolodine project. Hmm. Okay, you can take your time. Good afternoon, <coughs> chairs, Jangu sahab, and uh, engineer K. Lal Samela sahab, then chief engineer of the project in Christian. And uh, we are the contractors who executed two packages out of three packages in India side of the said project. The project was divided into three packages. Package one, that is starts from the Long Tlai petrol pump and leading up to the village, 38 kilometers. And package two was executed by another company, namely ARSS. And the third, that was 28 kilometer starts from the uh, there is no there was no village uh, because uh, this project was totally in green corridor and uh, you know that uh, construction of the roads is a sort of surgery the doctors uh, we called the doctors only who 
execute the surgery to the human body, but the road construction itself is surgery to the existing environmental settlement of the local uh, natural depositions. And mistake of a uh, medical doctor can take one life, but uh, mistake of this surgery can take, I think, decades of a human beings. It can waste decades of human beings. And constructing the road through the green corridor itself, a typical surgery to the existing depositions, natural depositions. In the Mizoram, the, the hill series is the youngest one of India. I think the professors know very well that uh, this series is very young. And when you are excavating the new deposition or new hill, you don't know what will happen. Because already sir has shown that uh, because uh, uh, this road is the unique road in Mizoram state, because we have maintained maximum 5% of the gradient. Even you cannot uh, make the slopeness of the road by your naked eye. So plain road is the first road of the Mizoram. Otherwise, in NS54, I think so, the gradient is uh, nearly somewhere it is 8%, 9% also. But in this road, throughout uh, within the India section, you will not find the gradient more than 5 degree, 5%, I can say. So this uh, width of the road is two lane. And again, I will mention that this was the first project of the Mizoram, which was two lane which was in two lane, because previously NS54 was also in single lane, and all the roads were in single lane. But this was the first green corridor project, which has executed in two lanes. Width of the bitumen is 7 meter, because it is two lane. And in the single lane, it is 3.75 meter, or in the curves, it is 4.2 meter maximum. So one can ride without any hesitation and uh, without any inconvenient up to the Jocha border right now. The present status of the project is uh, nearly 95% completion, physical completion. And uh, out of eight bridges was there. In my section, there were six, seven bridges, and one bridge was in the package two. Package two bridge is already completed, and the six bridges, that is, uh, there in Long Thlai, one is in Long Thlai section and one is on the border, exactly. The abutment two is in Myanmar and abutment one is in India. That is also 45 meter span. Substructure has been completed and uh, superstructure has been already fabricated in Delhi, but we are hesitates to transport right now because since last more than one month, project is still uh, in stand still due to the agitation of local landowners. And uh, that was the agitation starts day one of the project. Uh, sir, know very well. And I think uh, all the known people, sir is also chair, is also know very well, be, hails from the long fly only. The agitation regarding this uh, land acquisition compensation starts day one. When they came to know that stopping the work during the rainy season is not worthwhile, because work is already in a standstill in the, uh, during the rainy seasons. And in the Mizoram, the big road construction can be continued uh, only six months. A six months out of one year is wasted due to the heavy rains. <laughs> Mizoram enjoys, I think, 3,200 mm rains per year. It is quite high. And uh, particularly in the construction of the green corridor, it is too high, too, too high. So on the next, up from the next hesitation, they choose that six month also. So actually, initially for five or six years, we could do only one or two months out of the one year. And we realize that in the contract documents, I want to brought it into the light, that our contract drawings, contract documents are also the copied. I think this is the second most copied document 
after our constitution. Because in the plain area, the conditions are quite different than north, north, east, north, north east area. And the documentation of the contracts are same, same liquidating damage conditions, same time limit. Time limit is also same. Construct the road 100 kilometer and the time period, uh, uh, I think that was divided into three packages. So I can say construction of the road 40 kilometer in green corridor, the time was given initially four years. Out of that four years, two years was given to the rain. And I think out of the two years, more than one and a half year was snatched by the landowners. And they are telling that there is no delay, nothing is delay. Everybody, we are perfect to uh, justify our mistakes. We are, we are the human beings, you know, that we are having the good characteristics that we are never acceptable. We never accept our mistakes. Actually, we, uh, we, are, uh, we find out the mistakes of PWD or government of India and uh, government of India and PWD will blame on the contractor that you are wrong such type of the correspondence will take place and uh, the time will go. Another portion was there that availability of the material in Mizoram is quite critical because I have already mentioned that our hills are very, very raw, very young. So the material that fulfill the engineering quality of the engineering aspects, that is very difficult to find it out. And I will take the opportunity to tell you people that I think we were the first contractors or we were the first agency that adopt the riverbed material to construct the road process. Before that, I think nobody has used the riverbed material to construct the road constructions. It takes a long time to get approval and uh, all the that two IIT was included and given their reports. Thereafter, we adopted the riverbed material. Then extraction of the riverbed material is also, Sarah has told that during the rainy season, it is impossible. Only six months is there. So this was the one of the most uh, uh, difficulty we faced. And all the construction is likely to come in Mizoram. They will also face the same problem. And there is a limitation of the materials also because all the NGOs and all the peoples of the society, they are uh, having the objection because uh, the river streams are uh, being contaminated because we are just extracting the material, natural flow of the river is also obstructed. And uh, so many concerns are there in that one also. And another one was also there, uh, the project was awarded in uh, the last month or second last month of the 2010. And then that time, actually, Mizoram was the notified malaria region. Actually, we were not uh, aware about the situation of the malaria because we were considered that uh, malaria is a simply a, a disease. And uh, if you t uh, take some medicine, it's OK. But unfortunately, we lost 32 lives due to the malaria. Now, actually, I asked, I am very surprised since last three, four years, there is no malaria case. I have noticed. I don't know what has happened. Suddenly, that malaria disappears from the long Thai region. I don't know why. I don't know why. I asked the doctors also. They are also not aware about it. And they are also verify my uh, observation that, yes, there is a decline and critical decline in the malaria patients in the hospital also, not only in our camps. And uh, of course, it was the green corridors, and we were not aware about the valley side, depth of the valley. However, the cutting of the plane was also 100, 100 and 150 meter. But again, the valley is also again 100 meter. So we lose again uh, nearly 18 or 19 people due to the accidents case. That was purely. Uh, mistake of the drivers only because 
the drivers quality of the drivers in this hilly area and the quality of the drivers in the plain area is also different uh, aspect so thereafter we hired the local drivers and uh, that type of the accident uh, do not take place after that accident major accident was there uh, while we were collecting the material from the river bed and uh, the landslide is also a quite uh, concern during the construction we faced uh, big huge landslides sir has shown the live video and uh, you are listening are bap re kya ho gaya that is spelled out by our labors only and uh, fortunately we uh, did not lose any life due to the landslides however the landslides had taken place at the time of construction also the work was uh, workers were also doing things in that uh, same vicinity that things so now the road is completed nearly and the people are using uh, that road quite uh, freely all the sumos has been redirected to that road which was uh, going to uh, another uh, southern part of longtlai they are using that road they cut down their time limits by half 50% and the people who were not having uh, any approach to their uh, lands they are also having the approach to that land and uh, road is being used by the construction activity going on ns54 also and they are also having the same source of collection of material so they are also using that road everybody is using that road except that road was constructed for the purpose because that road was constructed for the uh, that uh, economic aspects only uh, not uh, the prosperity of mizoram only that was the prosperity for whole india if mizoram expects that uh, roads will bring the prosperity yes it is a fact that road brings the prosperity but you are opening the door only so not only the prosperity some side effects also will be there prosperity brings so many side effects also so the mizoram is the first receiver of that uh, all the side effects and prosperity also but in the concern of the prosperity what the mizoram state can do, can do? sir uh, that uh, uh, sir has already presented over there in the morning that he was informed the audience that uh, they export the 100 kg 1000 kg of uh, um, this uh, fruit to the uh, pineapple to the one of the renowned uh, outlet of dubai so sir thought it is a good news but 1000 kg of uh, dip, uh, export is not uh, a handsome figure actually it cannot take the prosperity to the mizoram because 1000 kg can export up to the uh, dubai through sumo also there is no need of the two lane road and that sea port and all that things it can be transported through the sumo you just go to the guwahati airport or th this airport and this can be transported by this thing also so that road now that road is connecting the longtlai town to the uh, mizoram aizol uh, these things and people can take the opportunity to ride up to the end of the mizoram and from the this thing so first of all actually the mizoram has the richest resource is their land only their land only other than the land i think that mizoram state unfortunately not enjoying any resource because there is no industry still has been uh, established over here and uh, uh, so many thing has not been there in the question of the trade so you can trade only the uh, that land is very fertile over here and land can be uh, used uh, to make a good resource Uh, to export or import and then the only the these road of, can be used mizoram government or central government cannot provide the every village or every home to connect the road now i think major uh, states of the uh, major districts of the mizoram is already connected with the highways and all that thing now more highways planning is in pipe in next coming 5 or 10 years i think mizoram will be the full of roads but resources in the mizoram should be developed 
the land reforms is required, then the uh, agriculture unit is required because I think I, 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 I am under the impression there is no major agriculture university is there in Mizoram. So the youth should be prepared uh, to take interest in agriculture so the land can be used. Now the peoples are using only 10 by 10 meter or 15 by 15 meters. They are growing this pineapple or some ginger is also. The gross production of the ginger and all the fruits is not in so much quantity that can be exported from the Mizoram. I can, uh, I, I hope so actually. So that development should be taken, this should be done overall there. Only then the road and uh, or likely to project uh, that uh, is likely to come in Mizoram. So many road project is likely to come over there. Only then the Mizoram can explore the benefit, full benefit of the road construction and road facility. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Poo Anil, for strictly maintaining the time. And I think you have been here in long life for quite a long time. So when I address you with Poo, you will be aware of it. I feel honored, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hmm. So, the last and the third speaker will be Joseph Lalming Tanga Chinza, who represents the biggest civil society in Long Lai, Young Lai Association. And since yesterday, many speakers and many participants, we repeatedly use wrong term one after another. We use NGO, NGO, NGO. YMA, YLA, whatever associations we have, they are not NGO. Don't call it NGO, they are civil societies only. NGO means, you know what is NGO? Organization with funding yeah. and different aspects. So what we call NGO in Mizoram, they are all civil societies. That also CBOs, communities-based organizations. Government, those in the government, they wrongly use the term, and even in academic also, sometimes we copy that. At least in academic circle, this wrong term should not be used again. So, Puzosef, he represents the biggest and the largest civil society in Long Klai. He is the general secretary of Central Young Lai Association. And we have already heard the experience and the hard facts from two engineers and now from the civil society. Okay, take your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, good evening, everyone. I feel privileged to be here, first of all, in front of all the scholars and highly qualified educationists. And even though I would very much like to speak in the local language, which I'm more comfortable, but since everyone is maintaining the uh, one language English, so I'll continue with that. Um, but then maybe I might not be able to impress myself, express myself clearly, um, but I'll try my best. And the uh, concern areas and the prospects, and I've heard uh, some of the presentation which was very knowledgeable personally for me. And one thing I would like to highlight in the first instance is as a YLA, we have been involved since the project started. To, uh, we have gone through all the villages, and today I'm going to present, the, as our chairman have mentioned, the society side of this project. First of all, let me take you to a, a brief glance of Long Thai District. Long Thai District is occupied with different tribes like Lai, Chakma, Bom, Bru, Rakhai, we call it Zakhai also, Pang, etc. And this project, the multimodal road, start from uh, the western hillside of Long Thai uh, town, and then it goes to Zhou Chachua village, which is the last village. And today I would uh, like to mention the people of Long Thai, and especially Zhou Chachua, would not appreciate Zorin Pui to be named because the village is Zhou Chachua, and I don't know where this uh, officially this name comes, I don't know, but everyone is mentioning Zorin Pui. 
but in the point of view of uh, Zota Tswabi Lakes, the VCP especially um, asked me uh, when uh, they know that I'm coming here, I was coming here, they told me to talk about this. They said they wanted it to be named Zota Tswa, the name of the village. So, so this project, as uh, me, Mr. Anil has mentioned, has not uh, gone through any village, though. But uh, the last village, Zota Tswa, is uh, uh, occupied by Bru and Zakai tribes. Uh, today, I would like to mention that there was a, a lot of mention regarding the compensation issues. I think from the government point of view, it was true that maybe, yes, the landowners has created problems. I want to focus that on, for in first instance by saying this. Uh, there is a lack of uh, awareness and preparedness from the government point of view. This I want to point out. Because when the project started, um, the initial work started in 2010, that is the time the people know this project was coming. Since the government, since 1990-91, has come up with policies like this, but the village, the village, uh, the local population have never had the idea this, this such big project is coming their way. They were living peacefully, happy in their own cultivation, even though not connected to the world, but they were happy indeed. Now, coming to the compensation issues, since Long Tlai, as always mentioned, is one of the remotest districts, the most, uh, in every indicator, health indicator, the worst, and literacy, the lowest. So you, uh, now you can make out how you can expect, how much you can expect from the people regarding getting an LSC for their land or getting a proper uh, document for their houses. They were living peacefully without proper documentation. It is, and it was their fault. But that doesn't mean that the project which is coming can just forcefully affect the people. This I want to mention. And even though uh, as a while we have tried to stop the landowners uh, from giving the, the protesting these things, because we know the only chance of survival for the people of Long Thai District is this project. And the government of India, or neither the government of Mizoram, might never give attention. Um, in 2017-16, the then uh, Deputy Commissioner, Ms. Muthama, has changed our views. We always uh, tell ourselves and tell the people we are the remotest districts. But an IS officer from Delhi came to Long Thai, and we, um, I had a trip with her twice or thrice. And she always tell me, Joseph, this is not the remotest district. Since the multimodal project, this is the frontier district. So since then, till today, I have always uh, told my colleagues and everyone, Long Thai district is the frontier district, and it will soon be. Now, regarding the lack of prepared awareness, I have mentioned preparedness. So the government, according to their rules and documentation, has uh, compensated the landowners. But what they have uh, not done is that the, the real uh, affected people, Long Thai is very peculiar. Two, three, uh, three rivers flow in this uh, side of the project. One is Chimtuipui uh, uh, River is there, we all know. And as Mr. Neil mentioned, when it comes to their site of the project, the river flows, and they call it Liapa. Liapa is a Chimtuipui River. Second is we had Tuipal River. Tuipal River is a, a very fertile area. The people dependent for their livelihood there. The third is Nyang Pui River. So these three rivers, 54 villages affected indirectly or directly, I may say. The people live on these products of the rivers and the forests. Now, when the project started, the spoils, they, we don't have, they don't have a proper spoil banks. Throughout the road, the spoils are just thrown on the side of the road, which when the rainy season comes, goes to the river, and all the rivers bec uh, becomes infertile and nothing fishing, nothing can, could be done. 
So these are the things they have not looked through. And now the people are suffering. No government jobs, no um, laborers works, no industries, nothing. So that is how they earn their living. So these are the, th the issues I think the government also need to focus. And till today, the people are suffering due to this. And um, collecting stones from the riverbed. Yes, um, uh, from the company side, yes, the project, it m might help because we have big, big uh, stones which can, they can burst it into smaller pieces and make their good roads. But we, we, uh, since the last two years, we have had uh, five local fishermen drown in the river because of uncertain depth in the river, because the stones were taken and the, when the river flows, no one could notice that, that, that certain depth would be there. So even this year, in Pipi uh, Ferry area, and a good fisherman, people thought this guy will never get drowned because he was so good. Even if we tied him up, he, he could swim to the river store. But due to this uh, destruction of uh, the rivers, um, we lost lives. And um, now um, the river, uh, the villages like Kolcho, Ferry, Liapa, they are uh, they are they lack the uh, to earn their live livelihood because the rivers were their main marketing place they catch fish and sell it to long town that's how they do it and uh, the third is uh, the sanctuary we have a Ngangpui sanctuary uh, which is very rich in animals and uh, trees and the different kind of flora and fauna and this sanctuary due to the easy accessibility of the road uh, has been tempered the trees are have been cut down and we when the in Mizo we call things sen, which is uh, uh, one full grown trees like th those can become like uh, um, like a sumo vehicle we have sumo like the size of a sumo more than that and it can grow up to 100 meters or so and long um, the stick was very rich in these things, things send this wood, but uh, due to the accessibility of these uh, roads, um, village like Kort Hindeng, which was covered with these kind of trees, now we we don't get any trees or proper forest. Now the central wireless since the past four or five years has concentrated. We have formed a Kumpuan committee, and we have been like uh, catching people, especially from the other side of the borders they come and there is no proper fencing with their machines cutting down the trees easily now the forests uh, are almost gone and uh, while is very stick we have a number of phone calls and letters even from my soul people doing their business please let uh, mm, let us supply these trees for the church and uh, many excuses were there but the central and it was difficult for the government also to literally stop because at the political level somehow they used to give permissions and that's how the forest is cut down. Now the central YLA has strictly uh, prohibited cutting down of trees since the past four years. This I want to mention because villages affected, the population affected, um, uh, the consequences we could not face. Those are the side effects we can say, but uh, I also want to point the benefits it brings um, to the society. Before, there's a home which was light lang area was not accessible from Long Thai. It takes two days at least. Now, um, a pregnant woman, if she's going to give birth at Long Thai Hospital, it takes maximum three hours. So easy accessibility in terms of uh, health, and education. Mong Butchua is occupied with Zakai, Rakai population, and their schools. Even though the government has schools there, they don't run the schools according to the government. They have their own priests. The priests, um, they learn from their priests. And they don't learn these alphabets we have. Um, so they have a different uh, system of teaching. But due to the connectivity, we are slowly uh, bringing them to, the, to our society. So 
as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, it's a very diverse district in terms of culture. So this road has brought us together, like the Bruce, on the way the Bruce, the, the Rakai, Chakma, everyone. So we can bring them like under one umbrella. Uh, as a Waile, uh, we, we bring them, we, we make our like Waile branch. Even though they don't speak the language, they just have a Waile branch there. So uh, with regards to the society's culture's point of view, it has uh, brought unity within the districts. And um, uh, today the issue with the um, Longklai district uh, is there are more constructions coming. Like we have, uh, as I mentioned with him before earlier, Zota Chwatu Lomasu Road is coming again, which will go through uh, Hongbu, Sabualklang village and such. So at this time also, Awareness has not been given from the government side. There's an announcement order from the deputy commissioner that new roads will be constructed, but the villagers were not aware of it. Right now, the Sabualklang village and Hongbu village has come to us and said we were not uh, given information regarding this. Compensation, compensation monetarily can be given, but their livelihood, their lifestyle, everything changes. It will not be the same again. So if we look through the government policies, um, the advantages with it will have will, with the international relations that I can understand. The strategic policy for the Indian government, I can understand. But the problem with, uh, the problem we face it with the local villages, they were okay with their present status. And with the coming of these policies, they feel neglected. And I also, uh, with all my research and experience, have seen at a high level, the, um, our political and officials has gone, flown over these uh, local village people and just go with, uh, they have gone with the project. And I think these, these are the mistakes which should not be repeated in, in, in future because uh, people will keep on mentioning the landowners blocking the roads and the landowners protesting but the real scene behind those if we don't get it then the, the local people will always be to be blamed but the thing is um, everyone sitting here I, I hope and I think everyone earns their own living very nicely in thousands and lakhs I don't know but the thing is, their only chance of survival were those rivers and those forests, and nothing else. So these are the issues I want to raise at this meeting. And if we have any more uh, questions, uh, apart from what I said, I'm ready to give any uh, answers as much as I can. And while, uh, lastly, but not least, uh, today we have um, a refugee problem, refugees problem from Bangladesh. Uh, Myanmar, like are like bomb, bomb and uh, the, the, the lie ethnic. We share the same ancestors with the Chin uh, state of Myanmar, so we have to take care of them. And now the new issues we have is um, um, you must have heard two weeks ago there was a kidnapping case near Zhaozhou village, and the Waile is constantly behind those things, and. People are coming with their uh, like AK-47 rifles and good machine guns, and it has brought unrest to the society. And this road, uh, this road, even though has brought uh, all the benefits to the society, it has also brought benefit for the terrorism side. Also, they can go to Myanmar in a few minutes and come back. And uh, and we have we are in constant touch with Arakan Army also, and the Arakan Army are denying that they are doing the kidnapping. These cases, uh, which is not known to ISOL, uh, we, we have solved it at the village level. So these are also the issues. Even though the some rifles are there, very handful, ten or fifteen, and they are not so much involved with the society. And the police, the nearest police post is in Bumkang, which is quite far. So these are the issues we have. But overall. As I mentioned, uh, Long Lai District, uh, the only chance for us to uh, have a real uh, development for the people uh, is this project, and we are eagerly waiting for the project to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for the brief and clear presentation. So we have heard three presenters, two 
three presenters or three stakeholders, two engineers. One engineer, Kusom Vela, who involved in the plan making process. Then Pu Anil, who carried out the plan. Then on the other hand, Pu Josep is leader of civil society who experienced the effects of this ongoing project. So we may now have time for interaction. If you have any query, observation, or question, you can raise it to specific speaker. And please introduce yourself and be clear with the question. And now time is open for the house for interaction. We have three engineers. Pu Joseph is a social engineer. <laughs> Oh, hello. I'm Dylan Nissan, a PhD research scholar from the Department of Political Science, Missouri University. And sir, I have a simple question to sir, respected sir Soma. And my question is, uh, sir, you have mentioned in the slide that uh, the hindrance of this project, the hindrance of this KMTT project, and one of the main hindrance, yes, there's no doubt that one of the most hindrance uh, and obstacle regarding this project is uh, compensation. So suppose if you are in a position uh, to grant this compensation, uh, will you grant it or concede it to the uh, one to uh, one who claim as the land owner? That's my simple question, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, we definitely we are ready to give genuine claimants, uh, but there are so many ungenuine claimants. We have experience during construction that there are some people with a placard of LSC numbers seeking their land. Where is this location? We do not know. And they come with that and they want to erect the signboard. They do not know the location of their land. In certain cases, the passes that were made uh, start, I came to know a few minutes ago that uh, starting from Zorin Pui, Zorin Pui, the name came very late, but that pass was issued 2008. The name of Zorin Pui, when was it started? 19? 2011. 2011. Yeah, the name was given by the, the then Trade and Commerce Minister, Lauren Diana Silo. So even before the name came, many years ago, they have got a pass in that name. That will show uh, the, the other fake passes. Let me talk about size of east portion. There is a four kilometer stretch size of east bypass. Initially, when survey was done, there were two tea land owners, in inland owners with the proper passes. And when a question was to be done, there were some passes, new pass holders. And then uh, after some time, the new pass holder come from another city, another big towns. And when we call them to stand in their respective land with their passes. Uh, since the land pass owned by the people from Long Tlai were more senior to the land pass holder hold by the, the size of East. So the size of East people stopped those interviews. And then I am told by my field staff that if we add up the length of the passes along four kilometer stretch, then it may reach Myanmar border. That's the story I have been told. Uh, genuine claimants we have to give. Then those who are involved in the agitation after the SCBI investigation, many of the land claimers, they were dropped from the list. Initially, there were almost 300 claimants. After this, I screen out. I don't remember the number of genuine claimants, maybe 130 something. Initially, 165 claimants were there. They were approved by the government. After that, it has gone up to a new claimants of about almost 300. Then after verification by ACB, it has gone down to maybe around 130 something. That is the final list given by the ACB. And with that, uh, assessment has been made by the DC. And then the estimate uh, appears to have been prepared for approval by government of India. Uh, 
Okay. In addition to what Sang Sang has raised, I would like to know the observation from Pusom Vela. So it was said that when all those land claims for compensations were plussed together, it seems to be double or triple of the actual land area. How, how is it in your finding? Or the size, the area, the total area. That, that, area. that shows that there are fake, a lot of fake claims. I think that is the only reason. Uh, initially, uh, when the Forest Ministry, uh, Environment Ministry gave in principle approval for forest clearance, uh, there was a certain area of land under forest. And then the remaining belonged to the private people or community, where in the community land, there was no land passes. But uh, after actual construction, when the new passes came, the total area of private land is much more than the land required for the whole sets of road construction. That's very surprising. And it was not possible to convince government of India. Uh, with all these land uh, areas put together, if it is more than the area for the road required, there is no land uh, spare for the forest. So because of that, uh, it is difficult for Ministry of Road Transport to approve the compensation issues. And then the, the Ministry of Environment also cannot give a final clearance until and unless we give a compensatory forest station and then NPV, net present value, to Forest Ministry. That's why till today we cannot get forest clearance and the environment ministry or some people, they have stopped the project again. That's the main reason. Yeah. I, uh, my question to sir, or uh, even other. Yeah, my, my name is Shushanta Taludar. I'm a journalist based in Guwahati. Uh, so uh, I just would like to know uh, from any of the panelists, probably uh, you, uh, whether before paying the compensation, I mean, when it, it is decided the project, the the opinion of the villagers is sought. What kind of compensation they need, whether in monetary compensation, or uh, and whether it is taken into account, whether they have financial literacy to the for utilization of that project for their articulating new livelihoods or uh, other loss of livelihoods that already take place because of the new forest. Yeah, that kind of issue, social issue, consultation with the stakeholders, the landowners, that was not actually done like uh, Mr. Joseph has rightly informed. Uh, in World Bank Project, uh, I was project director of World Bank Project right from the inception till completion. Uh, there was public consultation, and before land acquisition process was done, we sent NGOs to each village, what kind of property they have, what is their expectation, what kind of replacement of the land acquired they need. Uh, a lot of issues were discussed with them. Photograph were taken, environment issue, social issue, the big issue in urban project. But that kind of public consultation was not done in the highway projects. Uh, moreover, the land acquisition issue was not done by the state PWD. When land acquisition issue came, Normally what we do, we hand over to the district the collector, the deputy commissioner, responsible person. Uh, we never know whether he has done public consultation explaining the people as to what kind of project will come, whether land acquisition, I mean, uh, property cost can be given or not, that kind of thing. PWD was not aware of that. Nothing was done from our side. But uh, I don't know whether that kind of things were done by the DC or not. Uh, actually, what Puzosef has said, Publics were not consulted. That is correct. It was not done for this project. Uh, even in the NHI DCL project of True Land Road from Aizol, Sergip, uh, Tupang, something was done, but not to the extent that we have done in World Bank project. If we don't have any more query, so we have heard the 
three presenters, three speakers, I mean, from uh, various angle, technical angle and social angle. And from the interaction also, I think we have on new knowledge, the ground fact, the hard fact about what is going on and what will happen in future. So scholars and academicians coming here, I think uh, all these interactions may help them to have correct view about what is going on in this project. So we will carry on. Okay, now uh, let me invite the convener, Dr. Subalajan. Uh, thank you, um, Professor Dongel, Pucher. Uh, yes, now we have the uh, end part of this uh, uh, session, uh, the panel discussion session, as a distribution of a, a token, a memento to chair and all panelists. Uh, yes, the first I invite uh, is the head of in charge of the Department of Political Science, uh, Dr. Lalian Chunga. I for honor to our chair, Pu Dongel, uh, is with the token of, as a gift and the certificate. Please. Yeah. Uh, is next, as a uh, panel discussion, uh, is panelist, I invite Pu Engineer K. Lal Somvena. I uh, please. Yeah. I uh, put chair. Uh, uh, next is uh, is panelist. I invite Pu Anil Jangir. And last but not least, uh, as for today, uh, is Pu Joseph, please. He's a kind of social engineer, and uh, we are very thankful. Thankful <laughs> your presence here. <laughs> I say thank you, I po chair, I Professor J. Dongil for chairing a very successful of uh, the session. I am very glad and pleased as uh, to congratulate also, sir, uh, your nice kind of uh, chairing the session. I also thankful to all uh, panelists and uh, also for their kind of valuable and ground reality based kind of thoughts and it will enrich not only the seminar but also the report that I will send to the government of Mizoram and the funding agency ICWA. I am very thankful and very happy that uh, you were with the uh, two days uh, in the seminar in all sessions. So now they continue the two days uh, session and the session of a kind of concluding session of the two days seminar as a valedictory session. It will be continue without any break. So now we have guest uh, for uh, this uh, session. Uh, is our the chief guest uh, of valedictory session is uh, with us uh, uh, is our honorable uh, is professor uh, Sona as a finance officer, Mizoram University. Sir is uh, here with us. And uh, we have a uh, guest of honor as a ambassador Laldo Talana with us uh, as Professor uh, Dr. Ralte sir. Uh, he is a access CIS and a retired IFS and he served uh, as a couple of countries during his uh, foreign service uh, is abroad. Uh, he is with us uh, as a guest of honor in this session. and. Uh, the session chair will be by uh, is Professor J. Dongel as I continue the session chairing. And a uh, vote of thanks will be proposed by uh, Ms. 
एफ ए लाल राम लोनी एज ए को कन्वेनर ऑफ द सेमिनार एंड आई विल प्रेजेंट ब्रीफ ए समरी ऑफ द सेमिनार थैंक यू आई हैंड ओवर माइक टू पू डोंगेल एज ए सेशन चेयर ओके विल कैरी ऑन द सेशन एंड टू सेव टाइम आई विल नॉट गिव चेयर कॉमेंट नाउ आई विल कंबाइन इन द वेलिडिटी सेशन सो इट विल बी गुड इफ पुट्स होना एंड Mm put sona and put the lal do sona to come to the front side. Mm. May I now call F Laram Loni to come and hand over the necessary gift to our chief guest and guest of honor. Mm. I welcome you all in this valedictory program of today's national seminar we started the program yesterday we had inaugural program at 10 then after that we had three technical sessions yesterday and today we had two technical sessions and after that panel discussion and now we come to the end of the program so on behalf of the department of political science i would like to welcome our chief guest professor vanlal sona professor department of economics and finance officer of mizoram university and pu laudu thana ralte former ambassador and former chief in information commissioner of government of mizoram for sparing their valuable time and here with us and i am also thankful to all participants who are here in the program till the end till this very valedictory program and now may i invite our chief guest professor vanlal sona to express his thoughts and views as chief guest of the program uh, thank you to dogwela the chairman of this function and the organizers and my dear friends uh, i am really shocked to hear about the outcome of the project in relation to what happened to the uh ontlai people that is very much unexpected in view of what is going at the global level after we have that particular sustainable development sustainable development goal and the development work should be undertaken to minimize the suffering of the concern and the stakeholder must be informed properly on the pros and cons of that development the particular project outcome okay and that particular dialogue that could have been established between the people of long time and the government of india uh, should be undertaken properly and the more shocking part of the story is that even our engineers when the project was started in the 2011 okay were not aware of such kind of uh, incidents okay the people were totally ignored in the implementation of that project lives were lost livelihood were lost okay there was no concern for environmental protection all this we had heart was really frustrating personally also so <laughs> unexpectedly i want to start my focus on that a uh, particular aspect yes now i have a small uh, issue i want to share you i don't know whether it you have discussed this aspect or not but first of all uh it is indeed a very great privilege for me to be invited as chief guest for this valedictory function of the national seminar the theme is really relevant 
and very challenging academically as well. Surely, the seminar will have a positive outcome for policymakers, and uh, and it will also give outcome to various stakeholders involved, be it the state government and the people of Long Thai. I really concern it. Government of India, Myanmar people, and Myanmar government itself. I am thankful to Dr. Shingu, who took the initiative in organizing this seminar. Since I myself used to organize seminars several uh, over uh, several times over the years, I know the problems and the challenges in organizing a big seminar like this. This is not a small endeavor. Someone has to make a huge sacrifice to make it happen successfully. For instance, access to sponsoring agency to get funding is a big challenge. And mobilizing the right resource persons, the right experts, and the scholars in the field, and also providing logistics in the entire management demand great skill, patience, and diplomacy. It is a very engaging effort requiring strong determination. I deeply appreciate and express my gratitude to the organizing teams for your dedication and commitment for the seminar. Thank you to all. Now, coming to the seminar team, uh, the experts and scholars have already uh, uh, had an insightful deliberation on the related topics, and I'll not touch upon them because I don't have much idea about these uh, projects, how it uh, actually affects the people and the extent of uh, the uh, project completed also. Uh, but one thing I would like to state is that Kaladan project is going to become a game changer for the entire northeastern region of India. We all know the project faces a huge challenge in terms of topography and in terms of the prevalence of insurgency movement, especially within Myanmar, the project when completed, will have a significant impact on the development of the region. Not only Mizoram, not only Long Thai village, the entire northeastern region will be affected. It will open up alternative passages and connectivity between the landlocked northeastern region and mainland India. And even access to Myanmar through land route. And today I would like to recall that the Kaladan project, which was started in 2008, this is the year the agreement was signed between India and Myanmar to start the project. And you might know that way back in 2004, RITE has already completed the uh, so-called project report was already completed by 2004, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So I would like to recall that this Kaladan project that started in 2008 is one of the offshoots of India's Lukis policy that was initiated in 1991, and later it was rechristened as Akis policy. Akis policy is nothing but a modification of the name of the uh, that particular project. And it might remember that that Lukis policy was propelled by several factors. It was partly a response to India's economic problems at that time we face and partly by other international events that took place across the world during the later part of the 
1980s. You might remember that the economic condition in the early 1991 was so bad. India's foreign exchange was almost gone. We did not even foreign exchange reserve that could last even two weeks import. That was the bad condition. Our gold reserve were exported, uh, were uh, sent to England, and we are running for IMF uh, recovery uh, uh, emergency package. That was our condition. And with the suggestion of IMF, you, you may recall, the economy was, we are forced to liberalize our economy, okay? In 1991, the Indian economy, which was a close type of economy in those days, because we did not welcome any foreign investment, multinational company were not uh, given any incentive. Now imagine the situation we have today, okay? So I just want to re recollect those things. It was a close one. We are following import substitution technology, okay? Uh, we are using obsolete technology for production, and our export competitiveness was so low in those areas. So that was our condition. Now, the old regime was changed with open economy. We invited multinational, we invited foreign investors, and we adopted export-led development strategy. Multinational companies were given, they were given incentives, okay? This is the situation, just. And the next factors that was responsible for India's liberalization in 1991 was uh, the collapse of communist regime, especially USSR, okay? USSR was uh, strategically and economically very much linked with India at that particular point of time. M almost 20% of India's export went to Russia. But when Russia was collapsed in 1998, then, am I right? 91, okay. So the process started from 1985. So the period between 1985 to 1991 was a very turbulent times for Russia, okay? Then our export to Russia went down drastically. So when the entire process was completed, India was forced to seek alternative export market. And that was the point India started thinking about going eastward, okay? The, the disintegration of Soviet Union. Then another impetus come from WTO itself. WTO encouraged multilateral trading system, okay? That particular agreement also encouraged regional trading agreements, some sort of ASEAN, this European Union, this kind of new economic arrangement. So many free trade agreements are coming up, okay, across the world, not only between India and uh, related countries, across the world. Free trade agreements were coming, yet, coming up here and there. So the coming of uh, WTO, was an opportunity for India moving towards the Asian countries. And another great incentive, incentives come from the booming market of the Asian countries at that particular point of time. Before the financial crisis, the Asian, the so-called Asian tigers were coming up like anything. Okay, that were the incentives that India got from the international scenario. So India started several uh, development programs. I mean the foreign diplomacy, diplomatic change, which uh, Pudu Thane is very much aware of this, has been 
now concentrating towards uh, economic aspect. The traditional orientation, if I am not wrong, was traditional diplomacy, okay, political level. Now, diplomats are required to become economic diplomats. This is what I understood from Pudaite, who happened to my good friend at that during those times. So ambassador were to promote India's economic interests from that particular point onward. Now, get, having connection, having integration with ASEAN was one of the first important challenges India had. Then uh, Myanmar being a part of the ASEAN country, so the natural choice to have closer integration uh, with Asian country is first between Myanmar and India. This is, uh, so accordingly, in the early 1990s, to be very, f to be factual, 1994, border trades between Myanmar and India were signed, okay? Then, highway development inside Myanmar and along the uh, border town were also undertaken uh, land custom stations were also established in the border town of the two states. Well, uh, I am regret to say, Mizoram land custom was officially open, but it is not yet fully functional. And this is encouraging smuggling. If these land customs are properly Establish and if all the official uh, trade matters were dealt under the provision of LCS, then smuggle, smuggling will be greatly reduced and it will promote trade between India and Mizoram via uh, trade between India and Myanmar via this Zokhothar trade route also. But this is not what is happening. We understand everything. So now my point is the Kaladan project is expected to bring economic revolution in the notice. It is going to give a big boost to India's economic ties with Myanmar. Okay? Today we may not have any idea about it, but in a few years from now on, if the actual roads are open and trade were uh, facilities are open up, things will be really becoming very, very big. This is what we are expecting in the Kaladan Multi project. And you may be knowing that Indian Myanmar had a long historical association. Indian Myanmar are important trading partners to each other. The project is expected to bring closer economic cooperation and integration between the two countries that will promote development and prosperity in the two countries. India is Myanmar's fourth largest trading partner after China, Thailand, and Singapore. India is Myanmar's second biggest export market, and India is Myanmar's seventh biggest import market also. With alternative passes, the isolated region, the northeastern region, would be transformed into a regional sub for trade and commercial activities. The region will no longer be isolated what this, put, this project is put in place. In industrial enterprises, both national and international would come forward to take advantage of the rich natural resources we have in the northeastern region. The entire region could become a launching pad for business and commercial ventures that could take advantage of the big Indian market, which has a huge potential, okay? So once multinational companies are ready to come in, their target would be not us, but it would be the entire Indian sub-market, huge population, huge market, okay? This would be their target, not the notice. But if 
we prepare, if we provide proper atmosphere for starting business, then we can become the regional center of the, these foreign companies, including multinational companies. Now, let me briefly explain the challenges we have at the moment. Such are the prospects of having a big market coming or following the project. Certain needs, certain issues needs to be addressed to get the benefit from this entire exercise of India's Lucas policy. Okay? I'm referring to India Lucas policy. First, we need to address the poor infrastructures we have at the moment in the northeast. Compared to other parts of India, the level of infrastructure development is below the national average. In terms of national highway and in terms of other social facilities like university, education, health infrastructure, we are lacking behind national average in this particular area. And another great challenge we have is the integration of the state itself, the region itself, before we are integrating with the greater parts of uh, Asian countries, the region as a whole need to be integrated properly, okay? We have so many common things to share, so many common resources we have. Unless and until these resources are commonly owned or commonly shared, then we may be exploited by multinational companies. This is the real challenges we are facing. So the reason is often regarded as, a, regarded as one geographical unit, but the reality is very much different. The region, the regional state are far apart to one another. Now, imagine going to Calcutta is much easier than going to Imphal. Going to Delhi much easier than going to Imphal. Going to Kohima is very, very difficult. Only very few of us would have the chance to visit Itanagar. So in the real sense, the region is not integrated itself. Okay? This is the great challenges we are having at the moment. So my final point is we cannot alone depend on government sector to provide everything. So the great challenge we are facing at the moment is private sector development. And at this, to get this kind of private sector development, the enabling factors need to be built up by the state government, government of India, okay? What are these enabling environment? Good airports, good transport network, okay? Which are required to undertake any development activities by any private sector. The private sector may be multinational company or it may be uh, any other company local. So incentives and economic ecosystem need to be built up. Entrepreneur development is crucial to achieve this objective. Skill development of the people is another important challenge. Industrial development in the region is very much constrained by absence of skill manpower. Okay, this is a real challenge. So high quality human capital is indispensable in the age of technology driven development. So these are some of the issues I would like to share you on this occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sona, for a brief revision of the points which have been deliberated since yesterday. But he also touched some new aspect on the economic and trade aspect. Now may I call guest of honor, Pu Laldutra Naralte, to express his view and observation. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, am I audible? Uh, Chief Guest, uh, Professor Chona, uh, advisor to government, uh, my 
dear friend engineer Somvela, uh, convener Stella, uh, Professor Lal, uh, the presenters and attendees of the workshop. I think this is the second workshop on Kaladan project that I have attended since coming home two years ago. Uh, I have been part of the Lukis policy of the government uh, uh, since uh, its inception. Uh, and I have keenly watched the Kaladan project move forward because it uh, affects uh, my own state. Mm. And <laughs> I've watched it take infantile steps for the last 15 years, uh, and we are still uh, taking infantile steps. But uh, it's not an easy project because uh, it is not a domestic project. Uh, we are not uh, Chinese, uh, in spite of uh, Joseph uh, uh, crying about local people not being consulted. Uh, I've seen Chinese projects where they just uh, decided, uh, as a multi-story building, we need a highway. So people are told, take 50 rupees and go, or <laughs> go and take a housing some 200 miles away. Uh, at least uh, when you protest, and you stop the road, they don't come and take you away to another corner. Of course, you are already in the corner, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, I think uh, f uh, from the events that I have attended, uh, the Mizo people have actually taken the Kaladan project to heart. They would like to see it. Uh, come to fruition, uh, but uh, it's not easy. Uh, the authorities have got Sitway uh, uh, port ready, they've dredged it, they have the uh, economic, uh, free economic zone developed, they've got the buildings, but uh, how do you work in a place that is ravaged by uh, various kind of uh, political upheavals. And on top of that, uh, the Myanmar government itself has uh, changed since uh, the inception of the project. And we don't, we don't know whether they are good friends or they are not uh, very good friends uh, or reluctant friends. Because uh, a much more powerful in terms of using its economic power. Power has uh, already done major projects for them and uh, made it look easy. Whereas we, as a country, we like to partner. We don't go in and barge. We like to say, tell them how good the project is for them. And so we have to take the local country in, into consideration. Uh, not because we don't have the clout or we don't have the money, but because we don't like to do it the way others do it. We like to do it the way Indians do it, do it as friends. And this project is not a one-time project. Uh, it's not going to come up today and go tomorrow. We're building a bridge that we hope will last forever. And of course, a lot of uh, other issues come. International politics uh, is definitely the truth. but. The fact that uh, the government of India at uh, New Delhi, the central government, decided to go ahead with this itself is uh, uh, a big thing because uh, if the chicken's neck is broken, where will the northeast go? Uh, will be like East Pakistan, West Pakistan, and how long will we be northeast region of India? So, uh, would it turn into something else? And then, on top of that, even if the chicken's neck is not broken, if the transport route through Burma is better, and it opens up other things, the people of the northeast have more affinity with the people of the Southeast Asian countries. Will we start looking East, <coughs> working East, acting East, more than acting West? 
the homes of uh, Assam are the uh, rulers of Thailand. In Thailand, the king is uh, respected. So when they, uh, Thais come to uh, Assam, they come to look for their king's uh, ancestors among the homes of uh, Assam. There are linkages. We speak a Tibeto-Burmese language. We don't speak uh, Sanskrit. Uh, so it's a, it was a very, very big step that the government of India decided to have this project move forward. But uh, it had to do it in the sense uh, it could not uh, develop the Northeast through just the air and uh, through the chicken snack. Uh, and the government uh, in Bangladesh at that time was not very uh, helpful in restarting the waterways uh, that used to be there before independence. Before independence, I believe barges used to go from Silchar to uh, Calcutta. So why can't we restart those uh, now that we have a friendly government in Bangladesh? That's another question. Uh, it's not easy to, uh, doing any uh, project as big as this. Uh, but what I think, rather than looking backwards, what we need to do is we need to look forward. We Mizos, we have to look forward and see how it is going to affect us. Uh, but it's, since it's taken so long, I think uh, many of us have taken a sense of deja vu and are sort of less aware of what could be happening. Uh, but uh, let me tell you, once it happens, it's going to happen so fast that we will, we will not be ready uh, as uh, Engineer Anil mentioned, uh, people are going to have to have a major conceptualizing change and uh, we're going to have to deal with it. It's going to affect our economy, it's going to affect our social uh, milieu, it's going to affect our culture and it's going to change our lives uh, and our outlook on international issues. Uh, the, our nearest uh, interaction with the international side is the border huts that are there planning to be open on the Bangladesh border, a few up in the east. Uh, but once this project happens, as uh, uh, who mentioned, uh, these containers, these truck loads of containers are going to come. Uh, these containers are 20 feet, 40 feet. They can, they can carry a whole household. And so it's not just uh, one phone that is coming in, one pen that is coming in, or a TV. It's going to be a whole household that can come in in one truck, in one container. So the, and <laughs> if you're looking at barges bringing in that kind of stuff, you're going to have trucks and trucks uh, going and the demand of the Northeast, the eight, seven sisters of the Northeast, is going to be huge. So you're going to have trucks rolling one after the other. They're going to need food, they're going to need fuel, they're going to need a place to sleep, uh, the roads will have to be maintained, they'll need electricity, water, uh, facilities, and they don't care. Uh, Sundays. Service has to be provided 24 by 7. So if we close on Sundays and we close our borders on Sundays, they're going to say, forget it, we'll fly it, even if it costs more. So we'll have to change our attitudes culturally, socially. Uh, some things uh, will have to change. So today also my daughter asked me, why are you wearing that colorful shirt? Yeah, going as a former ambassador, wear a suit. I said, that is exactly what they will be expecting me to wear a suit, a retired ambassador, to, to go into a seminar on international issues. I said, I just want to give them a bit of a cultural shock. <laughs> uh, that they, they better be ready for something that's going to shock them. 
So this is an Indonesian shirt. So uh, although I would have liked to have worn a Burmese one, but <laughs> I thought this was more colorful. So, uh, so uh, this, we are going to have to live with it, and we are going to have to learn to live with it and be ready for it. Uh, so uh, of course, a lot of opportunities will open up. Uh, our people will have a chance to liaise with others. Uh, our tourism, hopefully, will uh, um, grow. <coughs> but we have to be ready for those kind of things. And uh, when something, uh, <coughs> it is uh, the law of nature that uh, to develop and to improve one's life demands grow. And according to Keynesian and other economists, if there is a demand, <coughs> supply will happen. So we should be ready to prepare the supplies. If we can't supply, people will look for other sources. So Mizoram has to wake up. Uh, CYLA will have to really work hard uh, to they bring their people up to stream on the opportunities that are going to come up. You've got to look forward. Don't just look at the government. Uh, you have to sometimes do it yourself. And uh, you will have to look at uh, possibilities of uh, uh, road transport people or others who will have a stake in the process later on. Work with them from now so that when it comes into stream five years, you are ready. You have your tea boots ready. You have your uh, supplies for uh, rice and meat and other things, uh, you know, you, government can't do all that. If the government does it, government will eat up all the money. So your people will not eat up. You will not benefit. You will get compensation once and that's it. Half of it will be drunk, uh, drunk, uh, drunk up. Uh, so uh, you need to start uh, empowering your people from now. Uh, I told this to Tenzol people uh, about five, four years ago that they should have caddies, they should have uh, uh, tour operators ready because the Tenzol golf course was coming up and there are going to be huge opportunities uh, for the local uh, weaving also because golfers are going to bring their wives and golfers usually have quite a good amount of money and so uh, they need to gear up. But. Uh, Nobody actually took an initiative because every, we all wait for government. I think uh, we should not. Uh, w w the private sector can deliver better in many ways because it doesn't have to go through a whole lot of red tape. So it's time to start uh, investing uh, in those uh, things uh, at the moment. Uh, then. We have to get ready to deal with uh, what other political issues that will come up. Uh, they will be, as already mentioned, once the border opens up, good things come in, but you can't stop bad things coming in either. We already know with the greater influx of refugees uh, from the eastern side, the cost of number four has dropped by more than 50%. So more of our uh, youngsters have been suffering from that. So when the borders open up, you're going to have those kind of problems along with the good, uh, which uh, Joseph very uh, nicely pointed out. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, local stakeholders, civil society, uh, will start working more on this and uh, help the the people of Mizoram prepare for it. Uh, I cost of the project, duration of the project, how much is uh, coming. Those are things that uh, have been uh, discussed left and right, uh, right from the time it was uh, initiated. But uh, Mizo people have to really, really prepare themselves for the cultural and economic opportunities that are going to open up. Uh, for them, and otherwise uh, we will miss the bus. The bus, the trucks will just go drive right through, uh, go to um, Manipur, Meghalaya, Arunachal without st 
stopping uh, with us accepting to uh, refuel. So we need to gear up. Uh, I am very thankful to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I like uh, my, like it says, I, I'm a former ambassador ex, so I've, I'm uh, much over the hill, so, uh, I, but I would like everybody to look over, over the future, towards the future, and I would like to, on behalf of the seminar, thank the ICWA for looking at, uh, at us. And I would like to ask Dr. Rao to thank uh, the DG, a good friend of mine, for looking east and acting east. <laughs> and we would like to request uh, her to continue uh, putting more funds into such kind of studies because they really do have an impact and it's good for us to look at this as uh, uh, we just heard from our chief guest. The region itself is not integrated. So what do you talk about integration with the rest of the country? So this, such kind of uh, seminars help integrate us better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Udalal Dutlana, for expressing his diplomatic experience with local touch. He's a good speaker. I was together with him in different programs two, three times. And he's a convincing speaker also. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and we, uh, we could have successful seminar this time because of being financed by Indian Council of War Affairs, ICWA. And we have in our midst ICWA representative, Dr. Tenzin Miran Ao, uh, who is also resource fellow, resource fellow in ICWA. He is here since yesterday, and now may I invite him to express his view and comment about the seminar and his observation. Okay, Timson. Good evening, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, personally, it has been a very enriching two days. I got to hear from a number of scholars, academicians, practitioners, and stakeholders. So I got a more in-depth understanding on the major, the prospects for sure, but also the challenges. So that itself was very enriching. And on uh, behalf of uh, uh, ICWA, we look forward to the report and hopefully also a edited book, which we would be more than happy to come out with. Um, connectivity, as I said yesterday, has been at the heart of India's uh, outreach with its, uh, with its neighbor. And uh, since the Lukis policy and the Aki's policy, uh, we have come a long way in terms of our uh, foreign policy and our outreach with the region. And uh, when I, uh, when when we're looking at the current uh, or the ongoing Aki's policy, I I still uh, recall uh, the three C's that was termed by our uh, former, uh, you know, uh, foreign minister uh, and uh, late foreign minister, Ms. Uh, Shushma Swaraj, when she talked about the three C's, that is commerce, connectivity, and culture. And the emphasis here was on connectivity because it brings in, a, I mean, a much more uh, deeper level of interconnectedness in terms of economic, in terms of social, in terms of, you know, it helps move, uh, it helps move uh, life. And uh, communities that are part of this uh, connectivity network, they benefit out of it, economically, socially, and in all aspects. So it brings up a more uh, robust development and growth for them. And uh, while it is true that uh, we are engaged in some major uh, connectivity uh, uh, projects, the trilateral highway and the Kaladhar, which is of concern, especially for uh, the state of Mizoram, uh, they, uh, they are part of the larger India's outreach to South, Southeast, and to East Asia, as also brought up by some of our speakers, which is very right, the economic, I mean, the maritime outreach, as we so say. So these have a, uh, these have a, a wider implication for the India and the region. And we're talking about the region here, we're talking about the larger Indo-Pacific, which some of our speakers also, I was very glad to listen to over the last uh, uh, 
uh, one uh, two days of deliberation. Uh, so uh, much has already been said, so I don't want to go on. Uh, I just want to congratulate again the organizers. And I know that it is not easy to put up uh, a national seminar because there's so many things part of it. There's not just the academic part, there's also the logistic part. And I would like to compliment him and the team and the entire faculties for undertaking such a um, uh, uh, massive endeavor and doing it successfully. And, I, uh, and we look forward for future collaboration in the future, either in online, offline, and uh, send us a proposal, and we'll be happy to look into it. So thank you so much once again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Timson Mirren, for the comment. And we expect that we may be able to bring out the papers into edited book. And this may be the beginning. We may continue to disturb you, not online, but we prefer offline. <laughs> now, may I invite prominent journalist Susanta Talukdar to express his view for a few minutes. Thank you, sir, for the, this privilege. Uh, it was a learning experience for me uh, as a media person. And uh, you must have seen I have sat through the, all the sessions, uh, except that yesterday I had a program in other department. Because uh, uh, there is ignorance on the part of the media about this project. And media is not proactive about this. I mean, whatever reporting is done only on the just catch lines, rhetorics, and coverage of the, some of the lectures. But then issues that, uh, the issues that are dealt in detail in these academic sessions like these, these needs to be percolated down to the uh, people. Then that can be only the media can do. But then provided that media takes an interest in this. So media has to be, uh, particularly the local media also takes, needs to be, collaborate with this. So I, I think that uh, for me it was a learning experience I came to know. And um, then it helps us open our uh, look the things that we uh, new, uh, new perspectives, not r uh, remain rigid with whatever I have al already seen or learned. So uh, I, I think uh, we, we, we did more this kind of uh, these seminars and it was such well organized and uh, every single uh, paper presented and the resource persons, they came up with their own organic things that helped us learn new things. Thank you. Thank you, Putalukdar, for expressing your views. And I had the privilege of being interviewed by him last year through online, but this seminar gave me the privilege to meet him physically. And now may I invite our convener, Dr. Swalal Jangu, to give a summary of the seminar. Uh, thank you, uh, respected session chair, Professor Zedongel. Uh, the seminar report is just in briefly I will present. Uh, I s actually, the seminar, the idea of uh, uh, organizing the seminar is based on my research project, uh, on Kaladan project, uh, funded by ICSSR, Indian Council of Social Science Research, New Delhi. I completed the project and uh, ready to send a report. So when I visited the Kaladan project site, I found a uh, uh, is many kind of uh, ground really untouched, unexplored, unattached uh, is with this uh, project. So I thought that uh, why I should not uh, organize a seminar. I should organize and I bring the people where I interacted when I visited field visit. So like uh, Pujangi, uh, Pujosep, they were there and also major uh, the check post, Jorin Pui check post, he could not attend uh, the seminar because of this kidnapping incident happened there. So then I realized and I prepared the plan to organize the seminar and bring the same people in the university to discuss, to get to know the ground realities. And uh, another thing that uh, is the wire the wire media, online media, the wire reported uh, like coverage the videography of the project long back. So that reporting was not uh, like balance and not kind of a uh, kind of a just as a media report like uh, sir mentioned. 
So that's why I organized this seminar and I approached uh, with the help of uh, uh, Miss F.A. She is a very kind of cooperative and uh, like uh, known for the like this kind of support and organizing giving idea me and uh, she helped. Uh, then I successfully organized the seminar. So last two days we having uh, the uh, various sessions of this uh, seminar, the Kaladan project, uh, prospects uh, and problems. Uh, we have a lot of prospects. Uh, we came to know from a uh, various resource person uh, in last uh, five uh, sessions. Uh, is the especially physical profile of the Kladan project uh, that was first session uh, chaired by Professor K. Robin, History Department, Mizoram University. And uh, he is a kind of a person who can speak on India, Myanmar, a kind of historical perspective, political perspective. And in this session, uh, Ms. Effie, she presented paper and she went to the Kaladan project site uh, twice. And that's so her uh, paper was uh, kind of uh, based on the survey opinion of the local people. The second uh, paper was presented by Lal Ming Sange, PhD scholar, Department of Political Science. Uh, she uh, she did try to connect the Kladan project uh, uh, with the uh, Bimastek, uh, how will the Bimastek help uh, to the Kladan project. Uh, and uh, the another paper was uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Stilian Ming Sanga, he is with us in sitting last in this uh, right side row. His PhD scholar and uh, he tried to present uh, an overview of a uh, uh, project especially the profile, economic profile, uh, the geostrategic profile he presented. And uh, one the paper uh, uh, presented by environment science scholar, uh, Mizoram University. It was very interesting paper uh, like uh, soil structure, a uh, physiochemical composition of the soil and uh, how it will affect the land, riverine, or also the future kind of uh, uh, ecology uh, around the uh, Kla uh, the Kladan project or highway. So uh, the session was first concluded with a couple of questions uh, asked by uh, Mr. Joe Moana. He is a kind of lonely based uh, as a uh, social activist. Yesterday he was with us, a uh, social activist, uh, Mr. Joe Moana. He was not invited. He came to know about the seminar on website of Mizoram University and immediately he took the sumo and he reached yesterday early morning. I was very surprised and very happy also that a person who involved like a study of social economic aspect of the local people and he mentioned that the government, Mizoram government or central government departments, they were not hearing or taking seriously his project. So that was also very great and very kind of ground inputs about this project. The second session on the transport, transportation and road, the chaired by Professor A. Shyam Kishore. Uh, Department of Political Science. In this uh, session, uh, the associate professor is Sanbana College, Government Sanbana College, Aizol. Uh, she presented very interesting paper, how with the media covered, covered or covering the Kladan project. And uh, this like uh, sir also, Susanta sir also mentioned, just as uh, advertising like, many media uh, she mentioned in her paper, that uh, many media like they projecting, they covering like a oh, project is already over and uh, like so much kind of cargo, truck, ship are moving and Mizoram is like emerging most peaceful state because of this project. Like uh, many papers I read the news uh, in mainland India especially. Then the uh, second paper was uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin, uh, he is also assistant professor political science, Mizoram Christian College in Aizol. He highlighted the forestry environment uh, and the development. He connected all these three very vulnerable aspects of the any project, forestry environment and the development. 
and uh, he mentioned that kind of uh, uh, how many kind of loopholes shortcomings uh, conducting that survey uh, social environment impact assessment. The third paper was mentioned uh, presented by Dr. Slal uh, uh, Tlongi. She is here, uh, Miss Mimi. Uh, she is a guest faculty in Department of Political Science. She presented the paper like a uh, uh, connectivity issue and uh, also the other project of the road and transportation in Mizoram, interstate uh, inter and interstate in Northeast uh, related to the road and transportation. And uh, the one interesting paper suddenly uh, yesterday I uh, that Lalom Kima is a PhD uh, scholar, environment science. He presented uh, that uh, paper, physiochemical uh, kind of properties of soil uh, in South Mizoram. And he is conducting PhD research also the soil, chem physiochemical soil composition, Mammoth and uh, Longclay and Sire districts. This today was uh, the second day and uh, in morning session was third security strategy and policy related to Kladan project. The session was chaired by uh, Dr. Lalian Chunga as a head of the Department of Political Science. And uh, in this session, uh, is the first paper was presented by uh, uh, Ms. Lalming Sangi, the PhD scholar. She highlighted that uh, a uh, kind of uh, extension of India's uh, East uh, Locust Policy, Indo-Pacific region, she connected uh, uh, that uh, Kaladan project uh, and uh, the India's uh, Indo-Pacific approach. Uh, and the second paper was presented by Dr. Uh, Lannum Dika Namte, uh, is, he is also uh, is sitting. So, uh, his paper was uh, kind of quite interesting. He highlighted that uh, various kind of uh, connectivity projects uh, are going on in Northeast uh, and uh, also like connecting project uh, uh, Southeast Asia and uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar other uh, also he highlighted. And uh, another paper was uh, presented by uh, Major Amit Yadav, the Assam Rifle, Aizol. Uh, he presented that kind of security scenario uh, like the past and the present and the future also, what kind of like prosperity and what may be kind of a hindrance and shortcomings uh, once the project will come into implementation. Uh, so he highlighted many security and policy perspective of the Kladan project. Uh, last paper was presented uh, as my colleague Dr. Uh, J.C. Zomwan Thanga. Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science. He highlighted that uh, locust policy is kind of not only uh, that uh, economic perspective, but also as a development of Northeast. And uh, he also uh, presented that di uh, dichotomy, that what kind of dichotomy Mizoram state having as a kind of leading uh, kind of state towards uh, in uh, East. And these are projects. The huge responsibility local people and the state government and other stakeholders in his paper. And uh, the last academic session uh, is uh, today, the fourth uh, was trade and connectivity session. It was chaired by Professor A. Muthu Lakshmi, the head of the Department of Public Administration. In this session, uh, five papers were presented. And the first was uh, Gautam uh, Singh as a PhD scholar and Department of Political Science. He is sitting there in the last corner. Uh, as he highlighted that a uh, kind of a borderland perspective of a connectivity and trade. And the second paper was presented by uh, Ms. Lalrim uh, Pui Rokom, PhD scholar, Department of Political Science. Uh, she highlighted the uh, various aspect of a uh, project, uh, not only project, but also other connectivity project uh, and that uh, uh, relation with Myanmar, what kind of political instability, certainty that affecting the implementation of the project. Uh, and uh, uh, another uh, very important uh, paper, as a, not as a kind of text, but it is a kind of video recording and also a physical live when uh, Mr. Ronald, when he uh, like uh, opened his video 
on his screen as a, he is as a assistant director and uh, department uh, commerce and industry government of mizoram during uh, his video presentation as a kind of we were like living or like having sense feeling like we are trading we are connecting with neighbors and the local people so it was really kind of a observation and many kind of eye opening observation he presented and he also presented the prospect like other project under the pipeline like state government union government like other kind of land custom station with bangladesh and maybe in future we have one more trade center with the bangladesh and the western side and the last paper was presented in this session dr sachin yadav is sitting behind uh, his left side row uh, he is assistant professor in uh, department of planning and architecture he highlighted that socio economic development uh, within mizoram and uh, northeast uh, if the socio economic development means improving that uh, local or intra or interstate connectivity then the such kind of project will helpful and will give kind of a strength and as uh, to the policy also and a uh, uh, kind of a project more prospects of the uh, kind of a project and others also programs and the last is session as a panel discussion it was not as an academic perspective but it was a kind of a discussion perspective so in this session uh, is the open discussion chaired by professor j dongel just uh, we concluded before uh, this valedictory session so in this session the first uh, discussion in the panel was uh, uh, is, uh, is kind of engineer and uh, uh, is advisor to the cm uh, is uh, spo k lalsom vena uh, he presented kind of a uh, all aspect of the project pladan project from the beginning to the end and also he uh, presented that uh, future and uh, he appealed a kind of appealing uh, that local people should involve and should take seriously and government also approach to the local people so that such a project can easily implement and uh, outcomes uh, come early the second uh, panel uh, discussion i uh, was uh, is Uh, Mr. Poo Anil Jangit, he like he really brought that ground reality that was uh, like uh, not in media also, not in the mainstream also. Only the local people they know and what are the things sufferings, their pains, uh, kind of a thirty-two lives lost in one incident, then another five people lost in another kind of incident. and one more incident like uh, especially uh, landslide so total uh, 45 people lives lost uh, uh, during this uh, project uh, implementation especially road construction so that kind of uh, and he highlighted a uh, kind of uh, the ground reality of uh, how with the uh, uh, foundation uh, kind of uh, uh, land acquisition issues and other issues he highlighted in his discussion and the last was the uh, is a uh, discussion panel uh, is pujoseb he is a social engineer and uh, he is a kind of a highlighted that we don't know that what people are thinking he brought the idea the people's feelings people's aspiration in our seminar with he shared with us uh, and he uh, said that i uh, uh, this project uh, uh, not only bringing prosperity but will bring many kind of uh, issues also and that we should ready to uh, tackle to uh, uh, like take challenge and the upcoming issues especially the security and uh, other kind of threats uh, that uh, is anticipated in future uh, from myanmar side or either side uh, so thank you to joseph and all thank you to uh, like all resource person in four uh, five uh, sessions now the last is just uh, uh, we are in sitting as a session chair pudongel as a uh, valedictory session 
In this session, uh, our chief guest, uh, Professor Van Lal Sona, uh, is finance officer. Uh, we were missing one important resource person as a economic perspective, and sir fulfilled that kind of a perspective. He is a professor of economics, and uh, sir, thank you for your uh, like you presented that background, economic background of the and this India's uh, look east policy, act east policy, and uh, the project, and uh, him uh, you stress uh, is the kind of a. Uh, private sector development without involvement of private sector, a, such kind of project will not bring more prosperity, benefit to the local people. The second uh, kind of uh, uh, like uh, our uh, guest of honor uh, is uh, Ambassador uh, is Lal Thana, uh, Lal Dutana Ralte sir. Uh, is, it also like uh, you concluded all the uh, things and you included all kind of aspect of the project uh, seminar, you shared your experience, uh, the police implementation, how we that uh, uh, international community and the local uh, like community stakeholders, uh, they are taking uh, the project uh, and the other kind of benefits of the project. Uh, uh, so thank you, sir, for uh, presence and uh, accepting my invitation, very simple way. And I'm very thankful uh, as my department, especially not only like as a word of thanks, but as a helping me preparing this uh, seminar, bringing the seminar as a offline to my uh, senior colleagues and Pujesi uh, and uh, my scholars all. Uh, so I'm thankful to all and I also thankful to uh, as, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Susan Talukdar, sir, for your uh, comment and your presence uh, in all sessions except one session with us. And uh, the last day, uh, that kind of a uh, comment uh, given observation by uh, Dr. Thame uh, Jaren Meren, uh, without uh, his comment uh, as a kind of uh, concluding of the seminar. So, your comment as a kind of uh, enough thing for us uh, concluding the seminar. So, I stop here taking some extra minutes. Thank you for your presence, your like taking seriously the seminar and deliberation and I am very happy that uh, I will uh, bring the report of the seminar and the uh, publication of the seminar kind of lecture deliberation in future very soon. Thank you to all uh, for the uh, report and presentation. Hmm. Thank you, Dr. Suwalal Jangu, for brief synthesization of the deliberation which was going on from yesterday till the present. And uh, the seminar has been sponsored by ICWA and uh, Planning and Program Implementation Department Government of Mizoram also has some share. Thank you to pra Planning and Program, program Implementation Department. And I did not give any comment as chairman's remark in the previous session. And now I'll combine it. It will be very brief. So we have heard what have been deliberated and what have been expressed from yesterday till today. So we know all what Lugis policy is pursued, how it becomes act is from look is and how it has been pursued and from the deliberation and from what different ideas and thought which have been expressed we know that it is more of political rhetoric it is more of uh, so to say it, uh, political talk than the real work going on so compared to china in case of china whatever china profess practice will follow it. But that is lacking from the part of India. And yesterday our chief guest has expressed that once this look east policy is completed, literacy rate of Mizoram will be increased. That is just an assumption only. That is just an assumption only because in order that literacy rate will be improved, 
State government and ADC should have commitment, and state government and ADC should know how to utilize and how to use the civil societies of that, organ that area like YL and all. If not, it will end up just in political rhetoric again. Because why Mizoram literacy is low? Because of Longklai district, western side of Longklai district and Mami district, blue population. Till this blue population is improved, there will be no chance of improving Mizoram literacy rate. Because of that, commi political commitment and involvement of the civil society is required. Without the involvement of Wele in Longklai, there is no scope. Then today, Mizor Amit Yadav has presented, and due to paucity of time, I didn't intervene here at that time, but I told him after the session. This, the so-called tripolar war is imagination of Indian foreign policy. It is nowhere in the picture. Because forget about Russia. Russia is nowhere. Only US sees only China as a threat. Russia is no more. Russia is finished economically. So if one wants to be political power, it should be economically powerful. So in this regard, Russia is nowhere. So this so-called tripolar war, it, is, it may be imagination of some Indian policy framer, but it may not take place in the near future. And as I've said, uh, China is only the uh, man which uh, dominates and monopolates the whole world now. Because while I was in the United States on my Fulbright program last year, Whenever I visited shopping mall, it is all full of Chinese goods only. So everywhere it is being marketed, uh, monopolized by China. And with regard to this Lugis policy, what we have to know is that uh, this Lugis policy benefit or whatever is taking place, Lugis policy, it is passing over the notice, flying over the notice. This is the actual thing which is happening now. So what has been professed and what is taking place now, it is different. And I think all those are deliberated in this heated seminar also. Okay. And now may I call F. Laram Luni to propose word of thanks. Uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, Department of Political Science, I take this opportunity to, uh, to propose a vote of thanks to those who have directly or indirectly contributed to the, this two-day national seminar on the Kaladan Multimodal Transit Transport Project Prospects and Problems. At the outset, I thank our sponsor, the Indian Council of World Affairs, New Delhi, and the Department of Planning and Program Implement Implementation Department, Government of Mizoram, without whom this program would, uh, would not have been a success. Thank you, Dr. Demjen, for sponsoring the seminar and for, uh, and for the special lecture. I would like to uh, extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed chief guest, Dr. Adal Tangliana, Honorable Minister of Commerce and Industries Department, Governor of Mizoram, for gracing our inaugural, uh, inaugural session. Thank you to, to our guest of honor, Mr. Vivi Jagar, uh, a special invitee, Mr. Sushanta uh, Talukdar, uh, for delivering an insightful speech on the theme of the seminar. Our special thanks go to the Vice Chancellor of Missouri University and the Dean of Social Sciences. A very sincere thanks to our chief guest, Professor Vadnal Sona, Finance Officer, and the guest of honor, Ambassador Lalduthana, who also served under the government of Mizoram as a Chief Information uh, Commissioner. Thank you both for, for gracing our valedictory session. We are grateful to all the participants and various stakeholders of this connectivity of road construction, like the government agency and the NGOs, the church, the media, the construction companies, and the SM Rifles for participating actively in the paper deliberation and give us insightful presentation. Thank you to all the technical session chairs and paper presenters for sharing your in-depth knowledge and opinion on the various themes of the seminar. I am convinced that the paper presentation and panel discussion will be extremely useful in the long run of road connectivity, both for the government as well as for the rest. My, my sincere thanks to the department head, Dr. Lelian Tsunga, and all the faculties of the department for extending their endless support in the coordination, of this, this, in the coordination and the success of this two-day national seminar. And last, thank you everyone here today. We are honored by your presence, and without you, this seminar would not have been a success. Thank you, one and all.
The program is concluded. Thank you all for staying till the end.